Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Forged from Iron. We are here. We, you can see who's here. You, we've, we've put it on the thumbnail. We've put it in the titles. You can see the guy that's below us. We, we've got a live Q&A with the one and only Mr. Tony Cotty. How are you, sir? How you doing, Rob? How you doing, Duke? No, I'm, all, I'm all good, thanks. I'm just a bit worried about some of those pictures you put up at the start there just before it went live. There was a few really <laughs> young, awful pictures of me, but uh, hopefully it's not too scary tonight. I, I, what I did is I, I looked for a photograph of you in each of the kits that you had during oh, your time at, yeah. at, the, at, the, at the club. So um, I started sort of like in the 82, 83 season when obviously you made your debut yeah. and went went right the way through. So uh, yeah, the, the one that was really difficult was the scoreline kit, the, your, the, the last kit of your first spell. That was a really difficult one to try and find a photograph of you in. Yeah, um, yeah, I vaguely remember that one. Yeah, it was a bit of a weird kit, that one, wasn't it? But we did have some good ones. The boys of 86 one was obviously a good one, and I like the early ones. And even the, uh, the, the the big baggy ones, baggy shirts of the 90s were pretty good as well. So yeah. that's, uh, that's probably another story, that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, as, as a sort of like a tribute to yourself, as you can see, I've adorned see myself got, in yeah, the... Very nice. Yeah, had to be done, Tony. Had to be done. Um, before we get stuck into things, um, I'm just going to play this little promo just uh, for our friends at Iron Supporting Food Banks for, for you lovely people at home. Forge from Iron is proud to support Iron Supporting Food Banks. They are a group of West Ham United fans and friends inspired by the work of other football fan food banks around the country. They collect food and cash donations from Newham Food Bank in Beckton who supply seven distribution centres in the borough, seven days a week, and hand out several hundred three-day emergency food packs every month to families in need. They are also working with other groups to improve conditions for vulnerable adults and children in the Newham community. They are supported in their efforts by West Ham United Football Club, the WHU Foundation, LS185, London Legacy Development Corporation, Newham Council, the Met Police, Spire London East Hospital, Expedient Security, and a large number of West Ham and football fans. You can help by making a donation to their Just Giving page. You will find the link to this in the description section of the video details in this stream. Thank you for your support. Come on, you irons. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so let's get to it. So, to get your questions in, you guys in the live chat, please start your question beginning with the letter Q. It makes it a lot easier for us to, to find and, and scope out. So, um, Duke, I'll tell you what I'll let you do. If Is there any question that you've got for Tony before we get stuck into all of the bits and pieces we've got lined up? Um, actually, it's actually a question from my other half, actually, Tony. She, um, oh, this is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> she texted to me the other day. We've been uh, we were talking about you, – you scored several memorable goals over over the course of your, your, your way over your, – well, over your career, really. She, she actually asked, what was your favourite West Ham goal that you scored from your own memory banks – what was uh, what was your favourite West Ham goal? Um, I think, I mean, the the obvious one. It sounds a bit ridiculous, really, when you think of how many goals I scored, Duke. But uh, the, the first goal really is the one that always springs to mind for me. Um, you know, as as a West Ham fan, to to play for your hometown club and score at the age of seventeen and beat Tottenham as well three nil, you know, as as far as debuts go, it doesn't really get much better than that. Um I, I think technically my my overhead kit against Forest, which I think was I don't know whether it was eighty seven or eighty eight. I think it was eighty seven. Might be wrong on that, but it it was uh, up to par. We won three two and uh, the the only well I scored, actually scored two overhead kicks for West Ham, but one went in the top corner and the other went through the goalkeeper's legs. So I think the one that went in the top corner was probably technically a better goal than the other one. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, anyone who saw me play or anyone who's seen videos will see most most of my, but not all my goals, but most of my goals were were, were poachers goals. Really, you know, I was a goal scorer. I wasn't. I wasn't going to get the ball and, you know, well, very, very rarely get the ball and beat four players and put it in the top corner. I just wasn't that type of player. You know, I was very much a penalty box player. 
And, uh, you know, m most of the goals in football come in the penalty area, believe it or not. It's, you know, sometimes people sort of think, oh, well, really? I didn't know that. But it's, it's sort of pretty obvious, um, you know, if you watch football and you see where the goals come from. So you, you won't find too many spectacular goals. But the, the Forest one and certainly my debut goal, like, although not spectacular, that's the one that sticks out for me. Was the Forest goal, was that the one where the ball was crossed from our right flank and you're on the, the back yeah. stick and you go up and you do like a scissor kick? You got it, Rob. Yeah. And Wally tells, it, tells me it was a good uh, cross. I, I actually said it was head height and behind me. So it wasn't a good cross from Wally, although he claims it was. Um, but no, it was one of them where you... you know, I've tried it so many times that in, in the training ground. Me and Frank used to do it all the time over head kicks. And, you know, most of the time the balls were going on the railway line and hitting the corner flag and everything. But, you know, this one just, just called it flush. And, you know, there's no better feeling as a, as a, as a footballer when you, when you connect and you hit the ball flush and it just flies in the top corner. And it was just... You know, I, I, I knew it was a special goal and I knew it was, you know, a goal that you're very rarely going to get in your career. And to score that goal and then run towards the chicken run was just a great feeling for me. Did you know the moment you made contact with it, that's going in? Well, I did, but the you know, because I hit it so hard and because I was probably no more than probably, what, 10, 12 yards out, by the time I whacked it, it's probably uh, half a second from hit, leaving my foot going into the top corner. So... You haven't got too much time to think, but I knew that it was sort of at the right angle, the right position, the right time to try and execute it. And it was just, I, I just, on that occasion, it just went straight in the top corner and uh, by far the best goal I ever scored in my career. There was one goal, I, I did a little um, video montage, which hopefully I'll be have time to, to show you before we, we part ways, Tony. But there was one goal, I can't remember what the season was, but the, the it was in front of the North Bank. The ball's played through at you. And you literally, you've, you've gone past the goalkeeper and you're walking it towards the net. And you're about sort of like two feet from the line and you sort of, you boot it over. No one's anywhere near you. Were you tempted? It might have been really cheeky, but were you tempted to sort of stop the ball, get down on your hands and knees and nudge it over with your head? <laughs> um, the goal you're talking about, Rob, I know exactly what goal it was against Orient in the FA Cup. And um, the ball was, it was a very, very icy pitch and the ball was played forward to Kevin Keane. And Kevin done a dummy and he, I don't know whether he sort of meant to dummy it to get it himself. Yeah. Or whether he'd done the dummy for me. You're a bit like, I can't com compare Kevin King with Pele, but you you know the one in the World Cup where he dummies it and runs around the goalkeeper type yep. of thing, that type of incident. Um, and of course, because it was a frozen pitch, no one could get it, could sort of scramble back. And we was actually playing in trainers, believe it or not. It was that hard, the pitch that wow. day. And by the time I got the ball, I literally just, I, I would never have done what, what you said because I, you know, I, I, I'd like to think I was a, you know, I had a professional attitude and I wouldn't sort of, you know, stop it on the line and back heel it in or get down and head it or something stupid. I'm, I'm sure it would have sort of gone down in history as, as, as an amazing goal if I'd have done it. But you very rarely get in that position where I was sort of on the goal line. And by the time the last defender got back to me, he was sort of still on the penalty spot type of thing. So it was, it was a strange old goal. But um, yeah, I remember it well. Good, good. Right. OK, we've got several uh, video questions and also from the guys in the live chat. And, and you guys, if you think of any questions you, you want to sort of fire into Tony, as I say, just begin it with a cue, as it says on the ticker at the bottom. And we'll do our best to get as many of them into Tony as possible. So, Duke, um, what's the first video question you've got for Tony, please? Uh, first one we've got is from young Jake over uh, West Ham Unofficial. That's Hi TC, it's Jake from West Ham Unofficial. I hope you are well. Hello to Gatesy and Duke as well. Um, just a quick question for you, Tony. Um, would you rather play up front uh, at the moment in their current form with Antonio or Skamaka? Which one do you think uh, would bring the best out in you? Cheers, guys. Oh, good question, Jake. Um, I think being the player that I was, forget the other two boys, being the player that I was, I think probably Skamaka um, because I think he's... I can't describe him as a target man because I don't think, you know, I think that's a bit unfair to him. I think he's got a little bit more than that about him. But he's a big, tall boy. He's, a, you know, he's learning the game, obviously, at the moment. Um, and I think I could probably play off him. I watch him at times and I feel like he needs someone like me up front with him. Um, if I was to play with Mickey up front, I've, I mean, I watch him all the time. I go to as many games as I can. I do not know what Mickey's going to do. I don't think anyone does. I'm talking about Antonio, obviously. No, no one knows what he's going to do. So to play alongside him would be a bit difficult if you don't know what 
your mate's going to do. So, um, although I would love to have him in the team with me, I think the answer to the question is Skamaka. And, I, you know, as I say, I, I do feel a little bit sorry for him. We had the same sort of thing with Haller, really, you know, where he was up there. And, you know, he's obviously a good player. You, you can, you've only got to look what he's done since he's gone to Ajax. And, you know, at times, all right, the, there was times where you look, you think, come on, you can give us a bit more. I get that. But there were times where the service wasn't brilliant and you look at him thinking he needs help. Um, hopefully, David Moyes will try Antonio and Skamaka up front together at some stage. I don't know what game it might be, but we do need to have a look at it to see if it works. I thought we might have seen it at Old Trafford. I, I made the, the, the journey up there. I, I got, was quite lucky. I got some tickets quite late in the day and made, made the journey up there. And I was keeping my fingers crossed that we was going to see Skamaka and Antonio at some point. And... I think that when Skamaka got the yellow and then the subsequent foul, straight away I knew that he's getting hooked here. We're not going to yeah. see Antonio and Skamaka. And it was such a shame. But um, well, I, I think that they well, could be a good To be part fair, the here. game to have done it would have been the Bournemouth game. I mean, mm. you know, to play with what felt like three holding midfield players against Bournemouth to me was just crazy. I mean, it was a, it was a wonderful result, but it was a really, really poor game. But if ever you're going to try two players up front, surely the Bournemouth game would have been the one Man United away, I get it. You know, listen, they've got some good players. They're not, I don't mean they're a particularly good team at the moment, but they've got some really good players, Man United. If you play two up front, you know, you can get into trouble if you, you know, if they overrun you in midfield. But against Bournemouth, surely that would have been the ideal time to try those two up front. Absolutely. Um, Duke, what have we got in the uh, the live chat for Tony? So there's a few in there. Um, I'm, I'm going to throw up um, a question from Knight on the Tiles. Um, he says there uh, he had the pleasure of meeting you in Leon last year, and that you're a great down to earth fella. Uh, had a great time. But his question is: Who was the craziest player you played with, and also against? Oh, um, against probably Gaza. I think when I was in the England squad with him, I had three sort of two to three years of <laughs> having fun with Gaza, and um, you know he was just uh, he was just crackers, absolutely crackers. Um, and a wonderful player, as we all know. Um, but there was definitely something missing there in terms of his behaviour at times. But I think if you'd have taken that away from him, you wouldn't have had the same player. So sometimes I think you have to put up with that. And there's been many players over the years who are just a little bit different. And you know, you've got to. When sometimes when you get genius, you you get a troubled soul. And I mean, George Best is another one who immediately sort of springs to mind. Um, but I had great fun with Gaza in terms of players I played against. Uh, players I played with, he was actually his teammate at, at Tottenham. And, and John Moncur, I think, was a, was a real character at West Ham in the, in the 90s. When I when I went back to that dressing room, obviously I've been away for six years, and I came back to John Moncur, Martin Allen, Don Hutchison, Julian Dix, uh, Joran Bora. You know, there was <laughs> there was a uh, there was a few boys in that team, and uh, you know, Monks was very much the sort of ringleader. Um, and uh, you know he was a, he was a really good player, but he was a funny, funny boy. Most of his escapades tended to involve him getting naked. Yeah, um, there was one sort of <laughs> very fa- there was one very famous one where he um, he was uh, he, he was late for the warm up, and um, uh, we we didn't know what Monks was doing, and the, the, the painters and decorators had been into the training around at Chapel Heath. And uh, what Monks had done, he'd um, he'd gone to get a, a tin of white paint, and he put he got a paintbrush and he painted his hair. So he'd come out with white hair with all the paint dripping down his face, which was funny in itself. And then all he had on, apart from that, was his boots and his socks, and absolutely nothing else on. So as you can imagine, there was lots of things bouncing around as he come, and he just joined in the warm up as if to say, like, what you're looking at, boys. You know, he's, as if it was perfectly normal. It was all white paint everywhere. And uh, but yeah, Monks was he was just great fun, and I, I think you know I I don't know because I'm not privy to what goes on in the dressing room nowadays. But I think you know in my era, especially the 80s and the 90s, I think we had great fun. You know, it wasn't maybe it wasn't quite as professional at times as it should have been, but I think I think you need to have a bit of fun. And sometimes I look at the players and you think, are you really having fun? They've all got their headphones on, no one's talking to each other, and. Mm. You know, I don't think they had, I don't think they had the fun that we had when we played in my day. So you wouldn't, if if you could do it all again and sort of do it in this era, knowing what you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't swap. Oh, Rob, I wouldn't want 150 grand a week. Of course I wouldn't. <laughs> I would not be interested. 
Of course, I would want you know, listen, the only the only thing that's different is it's the money, and and yeah. you know the players are very fortunate now. They they get in a week what we used to get in a year, and that's the best way to sum it up. And um, you know they they are very very fortunate, lucky boys to get what they're getting. You know, good luck to them. I mean, I've got no problem with the the top players getting the money. It's not a problem. I think it's just when you see an average journeyman player who sits on the yeah. bench every week picking up his seventy grand a week. Uh, that sort of sometimes can get under your skin a little bit. But um, no, I love my era. Um, I love the 80s and the 90s. And I wouldn't change that, but I would like to have been paid a little bit more money than what I did get. Yeah, fair. Um, yeah. Duke, what else have we got in, in the video question section? Well, but before we go, before we go there, I'll, I'll just add a little one to come and be on mind. Mm-hmm. Tony, when you left us, obviously, originally, you know, yeah. the first time you... Um, we, we spoke to... Um, we spoke to Tony Carr not so long ago um, in much the same circumstances as we're here now. And he, he, he was talking about um, you obviously going up to Everton. Yeah. And he mentioned, um, obviously, Gaza. Gaza, I think, it was um, 2.2 million. Gaza was sold for. And then very close to it, your transfer came about. And obviously... It was said that uh, we want more money for you than what was spent on on Gaza Gaza. time. How did you cope with with with, with that at the time? Obviously, it, late, later on in the, the, I think it was later that month, um, the fee was eclipsed. I think it was Ian Rush, wasn't it? The the, the price tag was slightly higher. How yeah. did you cope with that being on your shoulders? You know, because back then it was two point two million. It was a lot of money. <clears throat> Well, I think the the, the official transfer joke was um, well, Gaza went for two million, and then West Ham said I could leave for two million and fifty thousand pounds, which is what the eventual official transfer fee was. And I only know that to be correct because I actually spoke to Jim Greenwood, who was the Everton secretary, one day because there were so many sort of figures. There were two million, two point two, like you just said. There was two point yeah. three, two point five. There was all sorts of figures banded around. But as far as I know, from the Everton secretary, it was two point uh, two million and fifty thousand, and the fifty thousand making me worth more than Gaza. And then you're quite right; Ian Rush then arrived uh, from Juventus back to Liverpool, but that was obviously involving uh, a foreign club. So my, I was a British record between two English clubs, and my records actually stayed with me until I think it was September '89, like for a whole year. And then Gary Pallister, believe it or not, as a defender, went from I think it was Middlesbrough to Manchester United for 2.3. And that obviously beat the record then. Um, but in answer to your question, I, I didn't really enjoy it. I, you know, I've got to be honest. Um, I, I didn't like being even compared to Gaza because, as I've already said, when I spoke about him, even though he was probably the best of my generation in terms of English players, uh, he could do things with a football that, you know, I wouldn't even attempt to do and I wouldn't want to do. Um, but, he couldn't score goals like me. He could score great goals, but he wasn't a, a great goal scorer. Obviously, you know, it's a diff, two different things. I, I, I knew on my day I was a good goal scorer. Uh, I, I knew I was a good goal scorer, but on my day I could be a great goal scorer. I knew that, but I didn't look at myself as the most expensive footballer. And by definition, people then thought, well, oh, because he's the most expensive player, um, you know, he's the best footballer. And, and that wasn't the case. So, you know, I, I got a little bit weighed down with it. I had a great start, as you know. I scored a hat trick on my debut for Everton. For Everton. I scored after 34 seconds, and you know, one four nil on my debut. And it was, you know, you could you could argue it was all downhill after that. But um, it, 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 it put even more pressure on me, really, because by getting a hat trick, everyone thought, oh yeah, he's going to get me. a bit like what Harlan's done now. But I've done it once. Harlan's done it already three times and already got lots and lots of goals. And you know, but he doesn't seem to be phased by it. Um, but you know, I, I personally, I, I didn't enjoy it and I didn't like it. Other players like someone like Harland, you know, Alan Shearer, another great example. Someone who was the record transfer and he absolutely reveled in the fact that he was the best player or the supposed best player in the country. You know, but I didn't really enjoy it. And you know, after a while, the pressure sort of got to me a little bit. Fair enough. So, Duke, have you got anything else in the in the video section for Tony to get his teeth into? Yeah, I have. I've got. I've got the airy man that is your brother. Uh, <laughs> I've got a question from Ben. Uh, here we go, Mister Cotty. I do hope you're keeping well and it's a real pleasure to be able to field a couple of questions to you. So my question to you is: obviously, you're 
a, a huge hero to a lot of West Ham fans and uh, you know aspiring players growing up I'm sure who was your footballing idols and heroes growing up and also being a traditional East End club Pie and Mash being the uh, typical fare of the East Ender what is your fa- favourite Pie and Mash shop uh, in the East End or further afield for that matter can I just say that that he <laughs> didn't get the looks? Obviously, you know. You keep you know. kidding yourself, boy. You keep kidding <laughs> yourself. That's fine. <laughs> a couple of good questions there, weren't there? Um, uh, in terms of pie mash, I think the one round the um, round the back of the old South Bank was probably my favourite one. Was that Nathan's? Was it Nathan's? Nathan's, yes. wasn't it? yeah. And um, I remember going there one day with uh, Tony Galm, obviously my teammate, and um, he told me to order double pie and double mash with liquor. And I said, well, Tony, I only want pie and mash. He said, no, he said, you're ordering me as well because I love it so much and I'm going to eat yours, he went. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I did end up um, eating my single pie and mash and daily hoovered up everything else. Um, in terms of heroes as a kid, uh, I had a few heroes. I, I mean, my West Ham hero was Brian Pop Robson, not the old Man United player, obviously the one that played for us. He had two spells, similar to me. Um, and, you know, he, he was... He was a wonderful player, uh, great goal scorer, and also a really, really good team player as well. And if you talk to the likes of Billy Bonds and Trevor Brook and Frank Lampard from that era, they will tell you just how good a player Pop was. And uh, he, he, he actually scored over 200 league goals in his career. And once Pop done that, that was always a target for me that, I, you know, Pop, my hero, has done 200 league goals. I have to score over 200 league goals, which I, I got there in the end, which was great. Um, two other players that I would, I would mention... Uh, Gerd Muller, who played for West Germany, Bayern Munich. I'm sure you guys remember Gerd the Muller, bomber. fantastic goal scorer. He had the bomber. And uh, the other one that I also really, really admired, and um, you know, probably not as good as a, a, technically a, 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 not as good a player as Pop Robson, and not a good a finisher as Gerd Muller. But what he what he just didn't quite have, he made up with with energy and enthusiasm, and that was Kevin Keegan. And you know, he was an amazing player. I love watching his 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 team ethic and his work rate and everything. But, I mean, there's a bit of a common theme with those three players. If you look at them all, they were, they was all probably about five seven five eight, And, and um, you know, one of the reasons that I like those players because, you know, I, I was moaning to my dad as a, as a schoolboy, you know, I, I was, I, I'm still small and I was always small. And, um, you know, at times I'm looking up to these big, huge defenders, moaning, saying, Dad, you know, they're, they're, they're miles too tall and everything. And he said, son, don't worry about it. He said, your granddad was five foot eight. I'm five foot eight. He said, you're going to be five foot eight. He said, why don't we look at players that are five foot eight, see if there's any good ones about. And of course, I've just mentioned three there. And there was there was other players. Even Pele was only five foot nine. So it wasn't about being six foot three. It was about, you know, players that could perform and play well. And if, if there's a lad, ain't been too bad, who's five foot six. Messi ain't been too bad, is he? Let's be honest. So, um, And Maradona, of course, five foot six. So... You know, it's not always about being, you know, I know I love Erling Haaland, he's six foot four, etc. I get it, but it's not always about being six foot four. Fair enough. Do you ever sort of like sit back at times and realise, <laughs> has it ever sort of crossed your mind that in the history of top flight English football, going back from 1888 to the current day, that you are equal 17th on the list? There's only 16 people in the history of English Top fight, flight football that's ahead of you in goal scoring. That must that must be a sense of great pride to you, surely. Do you know what, Bob? It's, uh, it, it, football's really funny. It's, you know, I'm sitting here tonight. I'm chatting with you guys. I'm really enjoying it, and it's you know getting lovely questions and that. And um, it, it's a bit surreal because it's it's almost like two people. You know, there's me, the person that's sitting here talking to you now, having a great chat, and then there was me, the footballer. And it's it's almost like it was you know two different people because at times you, you know you know obviously I'm on Twitter and things like that and every now and again someone puts a clip up of something about a goal that you scored or something and you look at it and you think was that really me you know did I did I really get that height to score the overhead kick that we spoke about earlier and things like that and this and it, it is it is a little bit weird um, I think you know, we all had our um, issues and and time to fill in, in in lockdown and it probably was only in lockdown that I I sort of actually found the time to sit down and analyze and and actually appreciate 
you know, what I had done in my career, really. I mean, that what the stat you've just come up with is an amazing stat, you know, but I, I didn't really know that until a couple of years ago. Um, I didn't even know that I was West Ham's first ever Premier League sco- uh, hat-tricks goal scorer. You know, I was the first player to score a hat-trick in the Premier League for West Ham. I, I didn't know that. And it's only when you sort of reflect on things and, and have a look at it, and, you know, no one can take that away from me. There, there could be three million hat-tricks over the next thousand years, but there, there'll only be one player that scored the first hat-trick, and that's me. And, you know, it, you, you, as I say, you just don't appreciate it at the time. I think you don't you don't have time. And it's probably a little bit like when you have your kids, like, and, you, and, and they're sort of two and three years of age, and you really want to appreciate how great he is and everything, and then all of a sudden you blink and they're 10 years of age, and then you think... Oh, you know, I, I wish I could sort of go back to when there was two, and you know, and it, it's gone at the moment. And I don't know. I'm trying to give it sort of an analogy of how I feel about it, but it's, it does feel like it's two people. There's, there's, there's me, the person, and then, then obviously mm. there was me, the footballer, and you know, you know, some some great achievements, but you don't always have the time to appreciate him. You say about you, you scored the first Premier League hat trick for West Ham. I actually remember the first time I ever saw you play. And I'm going to take you back to the 25th of October, 1983. I was seven. Yeah. And you were one of 11,000 in the ground. Yes. I was on my dad's shoulders (laughs) and I watched you score four goals. Uh, And in that moment, you became my first foot. Well, actually, no, you you became my first hero, not just football. You, You became in that moment my hero. I'm like, he scored four goals. We won 10 nil. Of course, I'm. I'm thinking that we're the greatest team in the world, which we are, but yeah. we're not at the same time sort of thing. But, yeah, I, I, that was my first experience of, of a match at What Bowling a first Crown. game, eh, Rob? Not bad. Game, not bad. Surely your dad must have said to you, it ain't like that every week. So. Every week. <laughs> I, I don't think he wanted to sort of burst my bubble, to be honest. And it's quite interesting because I, I latterly found out that it was also the first game of Gonzo from Hammers Chat. He, that was also his first game at oh, wow, uh, yeah. West Ham. Yeah, so I spoke a bit to of Gonzo, a yeah. yeah, I mean, and again, like, you know, that was a historic game, you know, with... Um, you know, we haven't scored ten goals since then. Didn't do it. Haven't done it before. Haven't done it since. And 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 again, you look back, and you know, I only scored four goals twice in my career. You know, once that that game for for West Ham, and then four for Everton when we beat Sunderland. And you know, that was the only two times in my career. So, yeah, like, what a what a great first game though. <laughs> wasn't wasn't bad, I've got to say. And uh, yeah, I've, I've, it was the first time I, I've read up on it. It's the first time that 10 goals had been scored in a match in the League Cup. And I think it only it's only ever happened one other time. I think yeah, Liverpool, Liverpool beat happened, didn't Fulham, 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 didn't they? Yeah, yeah, correct, yeah. yeah, that's the one. But uh, yeah, a little trip down memory lane for me there, Tony. So thanks for indulging me. Um, <laughs> Duke, what else have we got in the live chat, mate? I'm actually going to skip a few questions because I want to get Ooh. this one in because this one... This one made me smile. It's from uh, it's from the Dugout Football Channel. Yep. And I'm going to add my own little caveat to the end of it as well. But they've asked, would you ever be tempted <laughs> to go on Strictly, uh, Strictly Come Dancing or I'm a Celebrity? On the on the other side of that, have you ever been offered? So there's, there's two. Have you turned them down? Would you do it? What's, what's the deal? Right. So I'll give you guys an exclusive here. Um, I did do a trial for Dancing on Ice. Oh, hello. Um, and I actually thought I was really, really good, bearing in mind when I used to skate as a kid, I was awful. Um, and the reason I was really good is because the guy was holding my arm and I was skating around with him. And that was why I was so good. Um, but, again, it's quite funny. The, the, the um, I've done the sort of, uh, all, all the sort of, the, the practice and you know the sort of I suppose it's like an audition really and um, and what I didn't realise is one of the other people doing the audition was a guy called Anthony Cotton who um, is in Coronation Street I, I do believe so I yeah. don't think they really have an Anthony Cotty and an Anthony Cotton at the same time so obviously I didn't I, I lost out on that one um, and I am also uh, I've also filmed Tipping Point as well. So I've, I've been on Tipping Point and I'm due to be on Ben Shepherd, of course, big West Ham fan. And uh, the show is due to be I, I think it's going to be on sometime before Christmas. So everyone can watch out for that. I can't tell you how I got on or how I did or for obvious reasons. Um, uh, but the question is not about that. It's about Strictly. What I do Strictly, not in a million years. Um, I, I really admire Tony Adams for doing what he's doing, but I, I just don't think I could go through with that. 
I would love to do the jungle. I would 100% would do the jungle, but um, I don't know. At, at the moment, I can't see myself getting anywhere near it unless unless I do something really stupid or something happens along the line that makes me a little bit more famous. I, I, I can't see it happening, but you never know in life, I suppose. Oh, I, I, I couldn't think of anything worse than going into a jungle and, and eating. I mean, some of the stuff that they have to eat, it's just like, oh, no, no oh, chance. No. Yeah, oh, I'm I gone. can't even watch it. I, uh, Joe, Joe, my other half, Tony, has a video of me and my son. Uh, I think it was just over a year or so ago watching one of the episodes. And the two of us, he's, he's eight years old now. Um, and literally the two of us are sitting there covering our eyes I'm heaving, he's heaving. Just at the thought of what we're watching, these guys are putting uh, the grubs, and I'm like, no, and then he's copying me. He's doing exactly the same thing this year. She had a video on her phone, and I watch it back, and I'm, he's, every, like, they, they, you know, mimic, they mimic you, didn't they, the kids? Yeah. He's doing everything, literally, in time with me. I've, I've never seen anything like it. He's, um, we, we took him to, we took him to West Ham. Yeah, this is the only place where we differ, me and my son. Took him to West Ham and he's like, oh, do we have to go? Get in there. We're going. And he sat there with his feet up on the chair next to him because there was no one else next to him. Heading his phone, playing on his phone. I'm sitting there singing along with my daughter, who's 18. And he sat there with his face in his phone, absolutely uninterested, eight years old, taking him to West Ham. And he thought, I'm going, I'm going to disown him, I think. I can't, I can't have it. But my daughter... She loves going. I wouldn't worry about she's that. So, so much. I had a very similar experience. I've got twin boys and um, I took my twin boys to their first game at the old Upton Park. Uh, we was in the championship. We got relegated with the, 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 the great team of 2003 that managed to get relegated in unbelievably. And anyway, we was in the championship and I took my two boys. First ever game. Um, I looked round after half an hour, at which point we was 2-0 down at home to Wigan. And my two boys had their game boys and they was like that. And they were just, they wasn't even looking at the game. Exactly the same experience. Um, but now I'm, I, my boys are now 24. Um, one of them's a season ticket holder and the other one's a big West Ham fan as well. So there's still time and it's still, still hope. Like... You've, got to, you've just got to keep <laughs> persevering with it. Obviously, you you were from Forest Gate was where you was born. Is that right, Tony? Well, Forest Gate Hospital, Rob, which is uh, in West Ham. So, yeah. Um, the, the hospital was sort of run run right along where the railway line was. It was along that road there, sort of between Maryland, that, along that road. It's it, I think I was born in 65 and it was knocked down in sort of late 60s, I think. But mm. actually on my on my passport, the, the birthplace is West Ham. That's what it says. So it's, you know, although it was Forest Gate Hospital, born in West Ham. So for me to have a passport and every time you get your passport, I just it just always tickles me. Birthplace West Ham. And I think that's absolutely brilliant. Was there ever any moment along your pathway of becoming a West Ham fan that there was anyone that might have sort of possibly taken you off the right path? You know, was there ever a neighbour that tried to take you to Spurs or an uncle that tried to take you to, to Arsenal? Or was it just it was always going to be West Ham and nothing was going to change that? No, it was it was always West Ham. And the, the main reason for that really was that because the whole family was like, I think nowadays, I think, families are a little bit more split and divided and you always seem to get a Tottenham fan infiltrates the family or some, you know, or Arsenal or whatever and Chelsea. <laughs> yeah, sitting over happens. there. <clears throat> yeah, it happens, unfortunately. But um, when, when obviously I came into the world, I had like, my mum and dad, West Ham, uh, my uh, aunts and uncles are West Ham, my, my granddads, nans and granddads are West Ham. And I think my great granddads had gone to the 1923 FA Cup final with the White Horse wow. final. So, you know, my, my great uncle was a founder member of the supporters club. So it was, you know, the whole family, you know, we, the first 18 months of my life, I lived in East Ham and then we then moved out um, to, uh, I think we went to Whitford and then eventually came back and settled in Collier Row in Romford. Um, but all my family were very much East End, proper East End family and everyone was West Ham. So there was no... There was no one trying to influence me. The only person that tried to influence me was my uh, schoolboy friend. Who, uh, his name was Cole Cowley, and he was, uh, he was a big Arsenal fan. And um, we played in the same Sunday team together. And anyway, well, we was so I would have been uh, nine years of age, and um, we was on our FA Cup run of 74, 75. And my, my mate, Carl, he said, oh, my dad's got tickets to go to the quarterfinal where we can watch Arsenal beat West Ham. I said, oh, great. I said, can I come? 
and I got permission. My dad allowed me to go. Obviously, like, um, Cole's dad took us. I think there was three or four of us went to the game. They had free Arsenal when I was West Ham. And, of course, it was the muddiest pitch you've ever... I don't know whether you've ever seen it on YouTube. It's yeah. just the most ridiculous game of football ever. There's puddles everywhere and mud. And, and uh, we, we actually won 2-0 at Highbury. And I was at the game and I, um, I gave them so much stick. Um, and <laughs> he never mentioned about me supporting Arsenal after that. I'm, I'm not surprised, actually. And then I, I got to see the semi-final replay against Ipswich at Stamford yep. Bridge. And then my dad couldn't get tickets for the final. So, unfortunately, oh. I didn't go to the Fulham final. But I made up for it five years later. I went to the Arsenal one at Wembley. Well, you've seen one more FA Cup win than I've seen. I was there in 06 and I thought I was going to get to see it should have been. the FA Cup. And yeah. I always remember turning to my best mate who was who was sat next to me. And just I just said to him, the, the uh, ball comes out. I think it was four minutes that the yeah. fourth official put up. And at that point, I turned to my best mate and I went, quotes, unquote, we're going to win the cup. And as I turn around, this ball's dropping out of the air and running onto it with Stephen Gerrard. <clears throat> Dream shattered. Rob, my, <laughs> one day, my experience is even worse than that at Cardiff because I was at the game with my mate. We went to the 80 Cup final together. So, of course, we celebrated together. And then we're sitting there watching the game. The same thing, ball goes up, just gone into injury time. And he looked at me and he went, what do you reckon? I said, we'll be all right as long as the ball don't land at Stephen Gerrard's feet. And that's exactly oh, what happened. Oh, no. And then, of course, the ball went up in the air and, you know, a phenomenal goal, as we know. But, um, yeah, it was quite prophetic what I said, really, in many ways. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, not one of my finest quotes, I don't think. Oh, dear. Um, Duke, what else have we got for Tony? Uh, I've got a video question from uh, Paul. Let's, uh, let's get this one going. Uh, good evening, Mr. Tony Cotty. This is Paul. Uh, let me just quickly say it's a real honour to be able to ask uh, a goal-scoring hero, childhood hero of mine uh, at West Ham a uh, question. I've actually got two questions for the price of one, so I'll try to get it past the censors and get it in. Um, what I'd like to really ask is that, um, going back to 85-86, which of course is a, is a glorious year in our history, um, do you actually think that when Frank came and you were up front with Paul Goddard, as John Lard had intended, that that would have worked? Obviously, Paul Goddard got injured. I think it was at Birmingham. Frank transitioned up front and we went on to have that great season where you both were phenomenal. But actually, if you're taking a step back, do you think with you and Paul Goddard up front with Frank as an attacking midfielder would have also delivered the goods? Um, I'd be interested to know what you think about that. And that sort of leads to my second bit about given how great 85, 86 was, and I still even think about it now, um, could you pinpoint, do you think, why 86, 87 just didn't materialise? You scored a load of goals and Frank's goals dried up. Although he played quite well, I think, he, he just struggled to score. And I think Goddard was injured and moved on. And the goal-scoring responsibility fell on your shoulders, as it did until you left. So I just wonder why, you know, given the high hopes we had going into 86, 87, why, why that didn't pan out as we'd have liked. So, yeah, I'd like to hear all about it. Thanks very much for your time. Short and concise as ever, Paul. Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a couple of good questions in there, though, wasn't there? Um, I mean, it's quite unbelievable, really. When you, when you look back at what John Lyle was trying to achieve at the start of the 85-86 season, because, uh, I mean, I'd been in the first team for three seasons. I'd been top goal scorer. Um, and when I read in the newspaper that West Ham had signed another forward, which was obviously Frank McAvenny, I was actually fearful for my place because I was thinking, well, I'd, I'd come through the academy, you know, and the one, the player that normally makes way is the academy player and the players that have cost a lot of money, they're the ones that are going to play. So I went and had a chat with John Lowe. I went to his house, I rang him up. I said, John, can I come and see you? And he went, yeah, of course. This was just before pre-season started. And I went to his house in Abridge and I explained, you know, I was a bit worried about my position. He went, don't worry about it. He said, you're going to be starting. You're my goal scorer. And not, not a problem. I said, well, how's it going to work? And he said, well, he said, I'm going to actually play you up front with Paul Goddard. Now, bear in mind, I'd had a really good partnership with Paul Goddard in 84, 85, where we'd also scored lots of goals between us. He said, I bought Frank to play as a, basically as a number two. He's going to play in the hole just behind you two, what you would now call a number 10. And, you know, in those days, it was almost unheard of because every team was 4 4 2. And you didn't really have a number 10. Funny enough, a few years later, you had Peter Beardsley who sort of floated in that position. And he was sort of one of the the first sort of players to effectively play that role. Uh, but John reassured me. And uh, of course, as Paul said, like, you know, 
uh, Frank got um, sorry, Paul Goddard got injured after 40 minutes at Birmingham. Frank got pushed up front. Alan Dickens came on in midfield. We went to 4-4-2, and then we then won the the next home game. But we we had a poor start to the season. We had, that was the only win in the first seven games, and ultimately that you know everyone goes on about the weather and lose at home to Chelsea. But I think that start to the season really really cost us, and you know. Me personally, I didn't score in the first six games and that probably didn't help things. If I'd have scored a few more goals, then, you know, perhaps we would have, we only needed one or two more points and we would have been able to have beaten Everton in the last game and won the league. So great frustration, you know, for not just for the players, but for all the fans and everyone who, who went through that season. And then the second part of his his question, you know, 86, 87, I think we all had high hopes. We started the season really well. We won 3-2 at Old Trafford, but I think we was top of the league after three games. But the, the, although Frank didn't score the goals, the, the problem, I, I scored more goals than what I did in 85, 86. But the, the problem really was more defensively and it was more injuries than anything. I think Ray Stewart got injured. I think Alvin got injured. Tony Gale got injured. And so what was the mainstay of our defence? I, I think even Parksy was injured at one stage. You know, we just, we just didn't have the squad. We... 85-86, we had pretty much the same players play. A bit like Leicester in 2016, where they had the same team, the same players, no injuries, no suspensions, no European football to worry about. Exactly what Leicester had in 2016. We had that in 85-86. And then, of course, when you fast forward to the start of the following season, when you get the injuries, you know, without, you know, I'm not putting down any of the players in our squad, but they wasn't as good of players as, as an Alvin or a Gailey or a Ray Stewart who, you know, were sort of, I know Gailey never played, but the, that Alvin played for England, Ray played for Scotland, Parks, he was a well, you know, the most expensive goalkeeper in the world. They, these were players that, you you know, you couldn't really replace. And I think we suffered by not having the squad to compete. Whereas teams like Liverpool, Manchester United, you know, Everton, they had bigger squads and they was much easier to, it was much easier for them to deal with the injuries. And But it was... Um, it was a big blow and ultimately, you know, us not building on the 85-86 season eventually led to, well, Paul Goddard left, you know, Frank left and then, of course, I'm ending up on my own playing up front and, you know, I ultimately left because we just didn't build on the 85-86 season. So, you know, real, fr you know, double frustrations because I think we should have won the league that year. We was the best team. We played the best football. You know, we, we broke so many records. I think there's still 17 club records still exist from that season. That was how good it was. And, um, you know, we, we should have won the league. And then, of course, you then got the, the double frustration of, of us not building on it and the, the forward players leaving. And ultimately, I left and then West Ham get relegated. And it was really sad what happened, really, at the end of the 80s. I know that um, Wardy, I'm pretty sure it was Wardy, turned around and said, that if we'd have had in the 85-86 season, if we'd have had Julian Dix, prime Julian Dix, yeah. we wouldn't have just won the league. To quote uh, Wardy, we'd have pissed it. Do you kind of think that was that was the area that we could have, that we kind of missed out on? Uh, without I... wishing to put sort of like, you know, to, to do down the guys like Steve Wolford and George Paris who played in that role. But I was going to say that, you know, it's, it, I don't want to put down the... Cause, see, Wally was a really, really good player. He was a really good player. And Georgie Paris that season was phenomenal. Absolutely fantastic. So I don't want to put down those two players. Um, if you ask a simple question, is Ju was Julian a better footballer than those two? Then, of course, the answer is yes, because Julian's in your all-time team as a left-back, isn't he? You know, you, you take your pick, Julian or Frank Lampard Senior, as to who plays left-back in your best ever team. So, of course, he would have improved it. And the other um, player as well, that you know, or the other position where you could argue was probably centre midfield. You know, Alan Dickens was sensational. Um, but we had Jeff Pike and Neil Law in that holding role. And, and, and a year later, a young Paul Ince came through as well. We all know, regardless of what you think about Harry left West Ham, he was a fantastic player. And you can't say anything other than that. You know, his career was, was brilliant. And if we'd have had Dixie at left back and Paul Ince in midfield, then I think we definitely would have won the league. Well, oh, that would have been sensational. That would have been a sensational team, to be fair. So, sadly, wasn't to be. But there you go. Um, Duke, what else have we got in the uh, in the live chat section, please, mate? Well, we've got, we got 14 questions in the live chat. So, I'm going to rattle through uh, a few of these because we've only got a couple of video questions. And, obviously, I'm very aware, um, <clears throat> very aware of the time. Um, I'm going to go with... Um, I'm going to go with Kent. We'll start with Kent Hammers. Yep. Um, he asks... Uh, Mike Lowen has said that Emil Heskey... 
who was his best strike partner. And I know you played with um, Emil. Um, how good was he? Uh, I, I personally think he was one of England's most underrated strikers. Yeah, fully agree. Um, I had three years playing up front with Emil. Um, and, you know, the, 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 he's right. Mike, Michael Owen did say that, you know, how good a partner he was. I love playing up front with Heskey. And he was perfect for me at the stage of my career that I was at Leicester because, obviously, by the time I got to Leicester, I was 32, 33, 34 in the three seasons that I played. I couldn't run around like I used to. Not that I did much running as a, when I was younger, obviously, but uh, you know that that sort of running. I didn't want to run around, and I had a, I had a young twenty-year-old kid playing alongside me who was absolutely fantastic. Smashed all the defenders around, and he took all the pressure off me. And you know, as a result of that, we had a great partnership because I was scoring the goals. Emil was contributing in other areas and that, but he was he was a top player to to play alongside and. You know, I always say that Frank was my best strike partner, but Heskey's right up there. He was a great player to play with. Fair. Any any others, Duke? Um, yeah, plenty, Rob. <laughs> um, uh, we'll, I'll tell you what, we'll go with uh, another Rob. Um, he asks, uh, Tony, what do you make of our start to the season? And as a striker, our poor, poor conversion rate in front of goal. Uh, well, it's costing us at the moment, isn't it? Um, you know, to be fair, as I said, Scott I think he's done all right. He's scored a few goals, hasn't he? You know, Antonio's lost his place, and I'd like to see the two up front. Um, it's it's been a little bit frustrating, and I, I, I just I just feel a little bit that Moise is tinkering with the team. I don't, I'm not sure he quite knows what his best team is and what his best formation is, and. Possibly a lot of that is due to the big influx of players. You know, um, you know, it's in my opinion miles too many players. I, I, I don't like ten, twelve players arriving at the football club. Last time it happened under Pellegrini, it was an absolute disaster. It's too, it's too much of a transition in the dressing room, and you know, added to the fact that we, I know there was a lot of players left, and you lost Nobs, etc. I get all that, but um, you know, perhaps could have done with maybe three or four top you know, top, top players, maybe pay a little bit more for them rather than getting players a little bit less money. But anyway, I'm digressing. But um, yeah, we 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 need someone to step up to the plate now. I'm hoping that could be Skamaka. But, you know, again, like Rob was talking about records and sort of stats and everything. But the last player to score over 20 goals in the top flight to West Ham was me. And that was in 1987. So that is 35 years ago, and that sort of t that, that sort of shows you really where the problem has been for the club over the last 35 years. You know, Jermaine Defoe was a good goal scorer. You had the likes of Di Canio, you had Tevez. You know, we've had other good players at the club, but you, you just need someone, and they're so hard to find. I get that, and they cost a lot of money. Or you've got to get a gem come through the youth system, like what happened with me with someone who's going to come into the team and score goals. But we do need a goal scorer because that's the difference. That's what takes you from eighth, ninth position to fourth and fifth. And that's, you know, that's where we've got to aim for. You know, I, I want to try and see us get in the Champions League. And we had a great opportunity last season that we didn't take, obviously. But, you know, it's been a couple of good years and we all want to see West Ham doing as well as they can in Europe. Just before we go on to the next question, you, you said about, you know, you've got this thing, you've got Tony Cotty, the, the man, Tony Cotty, the player, the two different aspects. And you say there about you were the last top flight league goal scorer to get 20 plus league goals in a season in 87. Yeah. If and when that is eventually in in the history books and someone else does get 20 plus goals in, in the top flight league, will what you, I'd, I'd imagine you'd be quite conflicted there because Tony Cotty, the, the former player, will probably be quite be disappointed. Gutting, that, yeah. Only, that's what he's saying. I'll yeah. be as a player, but as a fan, and listen, first yeah. and foremost, I'm a fan. I'm not I'm yeah. not a player who became a fan. I'm a fan who became a player, and I'm now back to being a fan. So as gutted as I would be about someone getting over 20 league goals or over the 22, which is what I got, which is what they need to do, um, although I'll be gutted from a playing point of view, I will also be thrilled from a, a fan's point of view because it will mean that we've got someone who scored us the goals and it would mean that we're competing. We might win a cup off the back of it. We might get in the Europa League. We might get in the Champions League because you've got someone scoring all those goals. So... Yeah, I've, I, I, all I've ever wanted, Rob, is I've, all I've ever wanted is what's best for the club. And of course, of course, I want someone to get over 20 goals because you know that means we're going to have a good season. Absolutely. So, Duke, we've got another video question for Tony. Before we go there, I'm going to link in what Tony's just said. Actually, um, you know, you, you mentioned there you were the uh, when, when we got Frank. You know, you were the you were the player coming through the academy, and you, you felt that your place was was under 
you know, under scrutiny, under threat, really, from, from Frank coming in until you spoke with John. Um, I've got another question here from Robert. It says, um, have you seen anything of the youngsters in much of the youngsters? And if so, who do you think has a future at West Ham? Uh, Rob, I listen, I'd love to say that I get the time to go and watch the, the academy and I, I just don't really. Um, I, it, I, it's not a question I can really answer. The only thing I can say is that um, Kenny Brown Jr., uh, I saw him recently, a couple of months ago, and he was asked a similar sort of question and, that, and I, I asked him afterwards. I said, is there a, I think he said it was, I can't remember if it was the under-13s or the under-14s. He said there was a sort of really good group of players coming through the system together. But as we well know, you know, 13 or 14 year olds is different to 15, 16, 17 year olds. So um, I hope that they can, you know, nurture these players and bring them through. And hopefully we can get a group of players coming through like what we had in the early 21st century. Where we had all those fantastic players. But uh, I'm sorry, Bob, I can't answer the question because I just don't get to see the academy boys. Fair. Fair dues. Let's go into the video then. Uh, who we got next? It is. That's another Rob. We we can't we, we can't get away from Robs. <laughs> <laughs> so many of them. Here we go. Hi Tony, Robert Banks here. How are you doing? Um, just attached a couple of photos to this video uh, from you know one of the highlights of your career. Uh, you may well remember that day at Upton Park. Um, my question um, is about John Lyle. As you know, I'm doing a series of videos about John Lyle. I just want to know what, what he was like. How big a, an influence did he have on your career? Um, and how was he as a, as a manager? Can you put it into words, uh, how big a, an influence he was? Um, thank you for all your years of service, all your goals and all the great memories and hopefully speak to you soon. I, I I've known Rob a long, long time, and I actually spoke to him on the phone um, oh, probably about a month ago, and that. So he does do producing some really good uh, content on his YouTube yeah. channel and everything, which is great. Um, in answer to the question, um, it, it, it's a question as you can imagine. Like you, you, there's sort of some some sort of standard questions that you always get asked. You know, what's your favourite goal? You know, it's the toughest player you played against. All set. those sort of questions, and one of the most frequent questions I get asked is who was the best manager that you worked under now bearing in mind I worked under Martin O'Neill Bobby Robson was my England manager Harry Redknapp when I came back to West Ham Howard Kendall who was an Everton legend you know there's some four great names there that I would put right up there but the answer to the question is and always will be is that my best ever manager was John Lowe and and to try and put it in context and words for Rob you know everything that's happened to me since my debut is all down to John Lowe. You know, even talking to you guys tonight, without John Lowe, I'm, I'm not sitting here talking to you guys tonight because, you know, John had the, 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 the confidence and the, the faith in me as a 17-year-old and five months. That was all I was. I was a baby. I, you know, look back, I was so young to play professional football and be, you know, I was a small player as well. Most, most people would have looked and gone, no, we can't play him, he's too small, etc. But John put me in, I made my debut. He then nurtured me over the next sort of three, four, five months to the point where I then started the, the following season, albeit through injuries. No, poor God, I was injured. But then he put me in the first team as an 18-year-old and I was a regular. I played uh, another thing, but I, I didn't realise. I, I, I played, it was something like 200 league games on the trot, or something like that. It was something ridiculous. And John Lyle always picked me, you know, and he, you know, I had a few bad spells, you know, where you don't score, but... John always had faith in me. So, you know, in answer to the question, you know, John was my best manager and, you know, everything I've achieved and everything I've done since that debut, and I'm including my playing career and you know, even working for Sky Sports. You know, I, I don't get on Sky Sports if I've not played for West Ham. I'm not, you know, I can only play for West Ham if John Noel gives me the opportunity. So everything funnels back to that point. So I've got a huge amount to, to, that I owe to John Lowe and, you know, it's... It was so sad that he, you know, he died so young back in 2006. You know, he, he sort of left this world, you know, far too early. And, uh, you know, I think all the players that worked under, we all still miss him to this day. Yeah, I, I remember the, the FA Cup semi-final against Middlesbrough at Villa Park. And I always remember they, there, was a, there was a minute silence that they planned. And I was there and started the minute silence, no problem at all. And then there was this lone voice that just all of a sudden cried out, 
Johnny Lyle's Claret and Blue Army. And that was it. Everyone yeah. just erupted. And it was not in any way, shape or form. People that didn't understand the dynamic between West Ham fans and John Lyle yeah. might look at that as quite disrespectful. It was nothing of the sort. It was it was out of love and respect and affection um, for, for a, a great manager that we'd lost. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we had a, a very similar thing um, at the, the Bucharest game. Obviously, when when our beloved Queen died earlier in the season, and you know everyone you know was meant to be a minute silence, and of course we all ended up singing the national anthem. You know because you know John Lyle was obviously special to us as a as a West Ham manager, and you know if you're a West Ham fan, how you know what he means to you. And I'm not comparing John to the Queen, obviously, but you know the Queen. I've been alive 57 years, and I've only ever known the Queen, and it was again. Yeah, you know, I think it was a very spontaneous thing that the fans did. And, you know, I think that's what I love about the West Ham fans. They, they can always do something spontaneous. Sometimes it could be funny. Sometimes it could be historical. You know, it could be all sorts of different things and, you know, different occasions, obviously. But I, I think sometimes when things like that happen, it you know, it puts everything in perspective. And as you quite rightly say, Rob, it's not done out of disrespect. It's done out of respect. Definitely. Definitely. Um, what else you got for us, Duke? Uh, but probably too much with a very little time that we've got left, Rob. Um, do some quick fire ones, do come. Do, uh, well, I'll be honest with you, the, the ones we've got kind of pertain to um, this season and uh, Moise's negative, uh, the negativity surrounding Moise's tactics and stuff. And I don't really want to get bogged down with, with some of that. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to fire this one at you from Irish Tommy. Is there a club somewhere in the world that you would have loved to have played for um, other than other than our, our uh, fantastic club of, that we, we have ourselves. Yeah, not, not selling gore. <laughs> no, that was a nice holiday, though. I did enjoy my time in the lake. <laughs> um, <laughs> club in the world. Um, I, 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 I would have thought that most kids, and I, I think I would be the same if I was the seven-year-old. If I was seven now, then I, I think most kids would say Barcelona around Madrid. I think that's a pretty obvious standard answer uh, to, to come to the conclusion of. Um in terms of English clubs at this moment in time, I probably would like to be at Man City and I'd like to be Erling Haaland because I think to play in that team of world-class players, you know, whatever you might think of the club or whatever, you know, you can't help but admire their football and they, they play football the right way and they create so many chances. And, if you know, if you could, you know you see what Aguero did, got loads of goals for City and Haaland's going to do the same for them. So in terms of English club, I probably would play at City. Fair enough. Uh, I think we've got one video question left. Have we, Duke? Last video question. Um, this will be interesting. Um, question for Tony Cotty. Uh, big fan. Uh, the one thing I don't understand is his involvement with the PAI takeover bid or there or thereabouts. Um, I know it wasn't the only one, but nothing about the takeover made sense for considering what the owners wanted, uh, the fans wanted. You know, in in ownership um, and stuff, and if they were fans, what, what was their real agenda? So nothing really made sense to me. So if you could clear that up, that'd be great. <laughs> anyway, come on, your minds. Yeah, it's, uh, listen, it's a question I get asked a lot. My, my wife's just given me the five minutes for dinner, boys. By the way, so that was yep, my dinner. no worries. No, we're we'll, uh, yeah. Will, that's not an excuse to get out of the question. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, you we all make choices in life, and um, you know, I've. Uh, I've long wanted the club to be under the right ownership. Um, you know, Sullivan and Gold have done some some decent stuff for the club. There's other things I think they've let the fans down and not done what they should have done. That's just my opinion. You know, that hasn't changed and won't change. Um, you know, when I spoke to the Pie Boys, they was great lads. They had wonderful plans for the club. The problem that they had was they pretty much got involved in a, um, a sort of a, a media battle with David Sullivan. Um, you know, whatever you may think of David Sullivan, he's a very, very good businessman. And he's also pretty sort of shrewd in terms of dealing with the media and, and getting them on board or getting to say the right things. And uh, I think he sort of lured Pi into a, a situation that they shouldn't really have got involved in. Um, and by the time I got involved with the guys, there was a lot of firefighting going on. But, um, what I would say and what I would place on record is they're, they're really top, top guys. Um, they only had the club's best interests at heart. They had some wonderful plans, including the stadium. 
um, and you know they wanted me to get involved in terms of, of, of the media and also they wanted me to get in terms uh, involved in terms of, of, of being with the fans and you know I, I, I think I really feel that the fans there's a real disconnection between the board and the fans and it's been going on a long long time miles too long and you know hopefully there might be a change of ownership next year and if there is there needs to be a connection between the fans, you know, so that you don't get stupid walls put up in a stadium so that the home fans can't see the away fans. Oh, that, that really worked in the, in the game recently, didn't it, when they was all throwing flares and seats at each other and they put a wall up and that. It was just crazy. You know, don't charge the fans £7.50 or whatever it was for a pint. You know, make, you know the, the, the fans are what the club's all about. The club is all about the fans. And, you know, if the fans are unhappy, make them happy. Don't just ignore them and not give them what they want. That's what I don't get. And I'd love to be the buffer. I, where I get frustrated, I've offered and offered and offered and offered to David Sullivan and to David Gold and to Karen Brady, my services. I've told them what I would like to do, how I can help, and they just are not interested in me doing that. I hope that Mark Noble can bring something really good to the table, you know, because obviously he's got a really good role there. Um, but I get frustrated with it. And listen, it's not all about me. And you know, I, I just, I've, I've tried to do what I think is right for the club. And I think there needs to be a bond between the board and the fans. And, it, you know, that would have been one of my prime roles if I'd have, if we'd have got involved with Pi. And uh, I'd like to think that I would have made a difference. And at least I would listen and talk to guys like yourself. And if you're not happy, tell me what's wrong. And I'll go to the board and I'll try and make it right for you. That's what should happen. But it doesn't. And that's where I get frustrated. Tony, we've got lots of questions we're not going to get through because your dinner is ready. Um, My dinner is going to be burnt or either burnt or thrown at me in a minute. <laughs> no, Tony. And I'm only joking, boys. But it's, it's been great fun and, uh, you know, it's been some really good questions. Here. Perhaps we can do it again, maybe do it later in, later on in the season and then I can answer a few of the questions I didn't answer tonight. That would, that would be absolutely... You, you, you're welcome on the channel anytime. Red carpet treatment, you're in. Job done. <laughs> So, what I will say is, Tony, we're we're actually Gacy, you're going as well, aren't you? On Friday. Oh yes, um, the we, thirteen event. We are. Oh yes. yeah, you're, you're going to be at Romford, so you'll you'll see me up on stage with the boys. That's so please come and say hello to me. We'll get you a beer. Go. Look at them lovely faces. There you go. Look at that, dearie me. Is that really me? I think I think <laughs> there's some tickets still available. So if anyone's watching this, you can see it there. Just just give you a shout on that number. Uh, 20 quid per person. I believe there are till, still tickets available. Yeah, um, and they're always good events. Always good events. Absolutely. Tony yes. Tony Gale's hosting, who's a funny boy. So, yeah, it'll be a good night. If anyone wants to come along, you can see the number at the bottom now. Brilliant. Tony, I'll um, I'll kick you out. It's fine. And uh, enjoy your meal. And, and ho I'll, I'll, well, we'll see you Friday. See you Friday. I'll see you Friday. Come and say hello, boys. I'll speak to you later in the season. One final thing for all the amateurs. Come on, you irons. Cheers, boys. Have a great night. Take see care, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that that was a thrill. Honestly, I I can't tell wow. you, I can't tell you how much of a thrill that was. And believe me, when I say that, of all the interviews that we've done, I've every single one of them I've enjoyed. But you've got to understand from from my personal perspective, as I said during the interview, and I'm sure that when I said it, Tony was probably quite embarrassed and all the rest of it. <laughs> but he he was my first, not just my first footballing hero. He was my first hero. Well, my first hero outside of my family. Okay? Yeah, I know what you um, mean. I my first you mean. hero growing up would have been my dad and my granddad. Okay. So my first hero from outside the family unit was Tony Cotty. And I've just been speaking to the guy for half an hour. It's crazy. Absolutely crazy. Listen, listen, you guys in the live chat, there was so many questions. I mean, I've still got 11 that are starred. Uh, down the side, you know, uh, Black Metal, Corky, Rob, I've got another uh, single term, I've got another one from you, Trodge, uh, Adam Frankel, Cyber, we got yours in there, James, uh, Kate, Miss Hammer, Hammer 89, uh, Laboro 42. You know, there, there were so many. There was a couple there that, I, I, if I'm honest, I would have felt slightly uncomfortable asking. That's me. Um, Tony probably wouldn't have minded. There was, there was definitely the one that cropped up towards the end. That made me go. Hmm, I don't want to ask that one, um, but you know, you you guys are the ones that also make these shows. You know, yes. um, as as Rob just said there, you know, we we've now had 
uh, what, Stuart Slater, Tony Carr, David Cross, Ray Stewart, Tom McAllister, and now Tony Carty. You know, we've interviewed six now, Rob, of um, childhood heroes, childhood icons of ours. We watched these guys growing up. You know, maybe not Tony Carr, but Tony Carr certainly developed um, some of the core players that we watched growing up. You know, there was, you know, Paul Lintz, George Paris, Tony Cotty, these guys that all came through. You go, as, as Tony mentioned, you know, Carrick and, and Cole Lampard, Ferdinand, you know, those guys. Two years ago, nearly, Rob, nearly two months, we started this channel. And never in a million years, and I say it every time we interview someone, and I mean it even more this time, because, again, it's Tony Cotty. Yeah. I never thought we'd get to interview these guys. and I, 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 we, we never really, Rob, started it up to do any of that shit, nope. did we? We started it up just two geezers in the middle of lockdown, didn't really have much else oh, to do. Let's do a, let's let's do a let's YouTube do channel. Let's do, it wasn't even a YouTube oh. channel. That was bloody you. Um, and yet here we are. You know, I've, I've got to, I've got to talk to Tony Cotty. I've got to talk to Stuart Slater, Ray Stewart. You know, these Cheers, guys, Jake, appreciate it. Core, core players that I, I loved watching <laughs> growing up. Um, you know, Tom McAllister again. You know, oh, do I do remember him? You know, it's, I do. Yeah, you know Ray Stewart, uh, Tony Carr. Oh my God, it's madness Crazy. that we we get to sit here and do this. Tony propped up earlier, Rob, and I don't know if you saw me, but I just kind of went. That's Tony like, Cotty. This, 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 this I kept, I kept it. You know, I kept a lid on it, but I was inside. I was like, that's Tony Cotty. You know what I mean? <laughs> Crazy. And, that's how and, in, and in a couple of days' time, we're actually going to meet him face to face rather than over a, a, a sort of like the. the you know what? Thing. You know what, with Friday, do you know, do you know when I, the, the one thing, you know, I, I kind of made my mind up with Friday? Go on. Was, was David Cross. Yeah. When he said about, I'll, I'll buy you I'll boys buy you a beer. No, you won't. I'll be honest, that, that I, I was, I, I was showing, explaining to people what we do earlier. So I've got people in my pub that I, I keep going, um, oh, I'm interviewing Tony Cotty tonight. And they're like, what? Yeah. So, I threw the video up of us with David Cross on, on the TVs downstairs in the pub. And they were like, what the, f- what? And I was like, yeah, this is, this is what I do in my free time. This, this is, this is madness to me. And um, it was, uh, it was at that point that we got to the bit where he goes, Oh yeah, no, I'm, I'm down in, I'm down in London. Uh, and we'll do, you know, if, if I see you boys, if you're going to be there, we'll have a beer, let's go. You know? And I'm like, that's crazy, isn't it? 1980 FA, FA Cup final winner yeah. wants to buy me a beer. I'm going. <laughs> that, that's Definitely. it's just madness, Rob. These guys, like I say, idolise these guys growing up, and here what, we are sitting here having conversations. What, what, what are you guys? You, there's 25 of you that are still watching. Well, 24 now. One's one's had a better offer. Um, have you got three minutes and 23 seconds of your life that you can sort of hang around for? Because if oh, you can do, we? if, it, if, if you it's do, what I think it is, that, and there's that one guy, moment I want to talk guy, about. But that guy that you just saw, as I said earlier, league football has existed in this country since 1888. 8th of September, 1888, I think it was, if, I, if I've read it correctly, was the first weekend of league football in this country, right? There are only 16 men in that time from 1888 to right here, right now, that are ahead of Tony Cotty as far as top flight league goal scorers is concerned. Only two of them are alive. Just think, just let that sink in. Sorry, uh, he's, sorry, he's, 16 people in front of him and there are only two... Only two of them are rivers. still alive. That's fucking right? Madness, so just stop bro. and think about that. Walking the face of this earth, there are only two men who are still around oh. that scored more league goals in the top flight than Tony Cotty. And those two are Alan Shearer and Ian Rush. Mental. Anyway, three minutes and 23 seconds. Get your teeth into this.
one other little thing that I didn't mention. Little little nugget of information for anyone that's interested. All the years that West Ham have existed going back to 1895 when we came into being as Thames Ironworks and all the all the pe- different people down the years who have had the accolade at the end of the season of being our top goal scorer. Tony Cotty achieved that in six separate seasons. Only two people in the history of the club have ever achieved it more times in their career. One of them is Sir Jeff Hurst. We know what he did in his his career. World Cup hat-trick, say no more. And the other one was Vic Watson, who is our record goal scorer of all time. He he achieved it six times, six different seasons. He was our top goal scorer. Jeff Hurst did it in seven different seasons. Vic Watson did it in nine. Makes you wonder, Rob, doesn't it? I mean, we've, we've since was it GSB took over, we've had something like 30, 33 strikers, 38 strikers, something I, stupid. I like don't that. know. Must have, I would have thought it was more than that. but And it's, it's ridiculous. Um to think that he he's there, you know, and no one has scored twenty more than twenty top flight goals or in, in, in anything mm. actually um, in so long, you know. The, the, considering um, my thoughts on Bonds and Redknapp, um, I, I saw a couple of your, I saw a couple of your comments in there, mate. Did you know? Did Harry stab Bill? Only two people really know for sure, don't they? What you know happened. what? And that, that was uh, it. Was it was part of one of the reasons um, I didn't bring that com- that, that, yeah, that question up at awkward. the end with Tony? Um, that you know, it, it's hard, mate. I'd, I'd like to think, yeah, he did. Um, it was the top flight. Sorry, uh, Hammer. Um, with regards to that, you know, we you you can have my thoughts. I, I think it was a, a friendship that soured quite quickly. I, I and, and to be fair. I don't know what's gone on since, you know, both, both gentlemen are um, becoming, you know, they're getting older, um, mm. whatever the situation, whether, whether, you know, they've gone back and, and they've dealt with that situation as, I don't believe so. as is, I don't believe they have. Um, and you know what? I, I, if, if they, pardon me, if either of them wanted us to know, we'd know. It, you know, it would have been said out loud. You know, I'm pretty sure the question has been asked over the years of both of them. Um, and the fact that they've obviously kept tight-lipped or, or that information that hasn't necessarily made I've, it into the public domain. I was told a story by someone that was at an event that Billy Bonds was at. Now, like I say, this is, this is a version of events that I've been told second-hand. So if, if someone wants to turn around and say this never happened look i'm just telling you what i got told um, yeah. from from an individual is that they was at some event where billy bonds was one of the the guests and someone actually brought up harry redknapp's name and uh, the story that i got told was that billy bonds turned around and said quite flat out i am not i do not want to hear that man's name period yeah no, and i was like about- oh from from my understanding, uh, from what I remember at the time, again I don't believe it to be true, but whatever went on, Billy was offered a role upstairs, hmm. um, in the, either in the ballroom yeah, or or the, the you know the technical technical director's job, yeah, as you know, director football, football director's yeah, job. Yeah. And Bonzo, you know, for whatever reason, however that came about, Bonzo turned it down and then obviously ultimately, you know, left the club. Um, and again, you know, we may never know. We probably will never know no. what went on there. And if that's the case, then that's the case. I don't want to speculate. Um, I hold I hold both of them in high regards. You know, I, you know Bonzo being Bonzo. You know the, the players that we, the former players that we've spoken to, Rob. You know Stuart Slater, Tom McAllister. You know Ray Stewart, um, even Tony Carr. Tony you know Carr, David, yeah. David Cross. You know these guys spoke so highly of Bonzo. Um, yeah. You know, and and the, the, you know when you when you talk to we asked the question, didn't we? Would you like to have at your side if there was to be a tear up? Yeah. And, 
and they all they Didn't all hesitate. Said, you know, they all said, um, hmm. you know, that Bonzo would be the man that they want at their side. I do believe, you know, in, in answering your question from earlier, Hammer, that it did take too long um, for for the yes. club to, to honour him. But I can Same also really say, also, I was about to say, it also took them to far too long to yeah. honour Bobby Moore. What I tell you, what I don't like about this whole Bobby Moore thing is now how the current ownership kind of over overplay their hand in my opinion mm. with Bobby Moore when you consider how brushed under the carpet we treated him as a club not as a fan base the, yeah. the club side of things you know he was escorted out because he yep. wasn't you know he wasn't supposed wasn't where he was supposed to be etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, you do know that David Sullivan gave Bobby Moore a job don't you yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, but, that's part of the reason why sort of like David Sullivan puffs his chest out and says, yeah, yeah. you know, when when Bobby Moore was being basically ostracised from West Ham he United, was, he gave him a job. Now, yeah. whatever you think about David Sullivan, good, bad or indifferent, that is a fact. And, and listen, it doesn't... I, I, I believe it was all of them, actually, if I'm honest. I think, it, I think it was mainly the Kearns family that was in harness at that point. Because it was like late seventies, early eighties, from my recollection. So that well, would be the fact that it took to, you know, the nineties and and stuff. I I, I saw Bobby. Um, I had the privilege of meeting Bobby uh, in the weeks before his death. Um, he, he England Uruguay at the old Wembley. Um, I think I've told this story on here before, Rob. About um, I went just before few... the Italia ninety. Uh, we lost was, two one. No, it was nil nil. Oh, okay, it was nil nil. Okay. Um, and That's he, walked the, he walked around the corner, flat cap, big old sheepskin coat. And I was there with a couple of friends, and they were like, oh, It's John Martin. <laughs> Obviously, it was the sheepskin coat, Rob, and we were, yeah. we were a fair old way away. Yeah. I knew straight away who it was. I could, I, you know, don't get me wrong. You could see some some yellowing in the in the face, you know. Um, when I went up to him, I shook his hand, um, told him he was a hero of mine. Um, I thought nothing more of it. We went round to, to go into the stadium to watch the nil-nil draw. Um, I remember there being some some ultras or some. Uh, we, we were sat with a load of. Um, part of the school kids we've been given hmm. tickets we were buying them on the door this is back yeah. when you can buy tickets on the door and um, there was a lot of uh, a school that had obviously rocked up and had extra tickets and um, they spoke to a couple of the stewards outside the stadium and so I think it was me and about four of my school schoolmates and they sold us these extra tickets uh, the, the price that they got them at, which was obviously for the schools. So we ended up sitting with all these, these other, these, these other school kids um, and up in the stand above us, there was some sort of ultras or, you know, a, a firm, if you will. And this, yeah. yeah. Um, and then, yeah, a, a couple of weeks down the line, or it might've even been the next week um, that we lost probably our finest player. In, in no, probably opinion. about it. Um, you know, greatest ever captain that this country's ever had without a doubt you know and i i, I can actually say i i was privileged enough to have met bobby you know in in the week or two before he passed away um used to i, th I think he used to do uh capital gold commentary as well yep. you know and jonathan pierce jonathan pierce and i remember you know the good old days of sitting on the phone rob at the bottom of the stairs at my house in thamesmead on the phone after a game. Oh, you weren't on the club uh, call, were you? Talking, no, talking to the guys on Capital Gold, trying to oh. wait, wait to get wait to get my uh, my questions in, so I could ask the question. I remember actually asking I'm a the season question. ticket holder, mate. Yeah, I go as often. I, in fact, in the last calendar year, so since January, I've actually gone more games. Um, I've actually Cheers, gone Chris. to more games. This you behave yourself. Gone to more games this last calendar year than I ever went to at the old Upton Park because my my jobs never allowed it, and I don't mind the new stadium. I think it's a 
it's time world, to get out. It's, it's a world class stadium, but it's not a world class football stadium. No, but we'll get there if we can get our oh, hands it's on it. It's better than it was. Oh, significantly. But the carpet still, makes it better. It's still not. <laughs> You know, it's still not. Uh, it's a not football a football, stadium. and until until we can get in there and rip that carp, the, rip the carpet up, mm. dig out what's underneath it, get rid of them them two five aside football spaces that we've got at either end of the stadium underneath the uh, underneath the video screens. You know, if we can get rid of the uh, yeah, and, you know, unless they just want to put up some screens. Yeah, so I'm already hovering. There it is. Thank yeah, you very, very yeah. much. Get rid of that. I was hovering and waiting, Rob. I knew what was yeah. coming. Um, Bye. Naughty grandma. Um, mm. Yeah, if we can get rid of them five-a-side football pitches at either end of the stadium, I reckon they should put nets up and, and do a little raffle for you know, a couple of couple of small four-a-side games on them on them sections. A club could make some more money and we might yeah. be able to spend them on another strike. The score. thing is, I mean, Hammer, Hammer 89 makes uh, a, a point, and I don't disagree with it. It isn't the same. But then again, football has evolved and changed. I mean, if you look at the, 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 the Premier League era, it's now football is not, doesn't have the same community vibe that it had pre-Premier no. League. No, when we were kids growing up, board, it's it's bro. a completely different animal. It's um, it's it's more. It's not. <sighs> oh, I love it, Chris. Oh, Christopher, <laughs> I love it. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, yeah um, it's, it's, it's a different era. Yeah. yeah, it. You know, Premier uh, League has changed I'd everything. Say, it's all money. I'd say anything from probably League One upwards, maybe the Championship and the Premier League. If you go to um. Oh, if you go, even, well. even League One, I think, still has the feel of community football. Mm. League Two, certainly. You know, I think there's, there's oh, I don't even know. I think, I think there's an AFC Lewisham um, around there? there. I think there is a non league side that play just up the just up Lehigh Road and around the corner, okay. I believe, is where they play. I mean, I, I grew up and I, I used to go down to um, the lower road in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Good on you, James. And uh, I, I like the uh, I, I like I like the, uh, Chris's comment there. Bring back the wooden rattles, flat caps. You you, you, uh, hang on, hang on, hang on. Listen, if you're not if you're not getting a lid on a bottle into London Stadium, you definitely ain't getting a wooden rattle in. But you can take a flare if you're in the away section. Yeah, um, that's no, perfectly I fine. I, I I grew up. I used to go down to when we first moved over to to Thames Mead. Um, I spent some years um, not going to Thames Mead Town, but going up to Welling with friends from school, Welling United yeah, Football same. Club. Went down to Era from Belvedere, Rob, which used to be on the lower road in Belvedere. There's now, now a B&Q, B&Q there, yeah. and, a, and an Asda's there now. Yeah. I remember, well, that was where I played, Rob. That was when I, when I did my knee and I was with, obviously I went to Gillingham or had trials in Gillingham. That was who I played for. That was, that was my home ground. I used to watch them from all 12, I think I was 12 and 13, become a ball boy down there, then got training with them and then signed on and played for them at 14 and 15. Um, But that was back then when it, when, you know, you'd come out of the changing rooms as a player and you go into the bar where the fans were. You didn't go into your own private section or you're getting your multi-million dollar car and fuck off down the road. This was, I mean, I know I'm only talking conference level, but you'd go, this was even then, you talked to, was it, I think it was Crossy, and he said about going to, he'd go in the bar and have a beer with some of the fans after the game and, and stuff like that, you know? Yes, just we are, Hammer. Madness. We are on tomorrow. <laughs> oh, I, I, I'll be honest with you guys. I sent Rob a, a, a schedule yeah. on Sunday night, um, which meant... Oh, I think Tottenham are about to kick off. So if they score a goal or they concede a goal, you score, might hear my missus if we haven't ended the broadcast. I'm going to go down and watch it in a minute. I We had, we had a video yesterday, video with Tony today. Video for the preview tomorrow. Yeah. Game on Thursday. Review Friday. Hey, game, mate. We're going to have to talk about Rob. 
because neither of us are going to be about to do the review in the evening. Might, well, we've got one or two choices, haven't we? We're either going to have to do it immediately after the match. The problem with that is that we're then going to clash with every other channel that's doing it. And to be quite honest with you, if they we're going up against Hammer's chat... At the time. Well, they what I was going to say is maybe... Uh, maybe, but um, either that or we could just pre-record it and send it out Friday and pretend yeah, that I mean, we're actually there doing it. Live. it They'll never know. So then, yeah, we, so we got... <laughs> Yesterday, today, tomorrow, game Thursday, video Friday, video Saturday for the game Sunday, video Monday, video Tuesday for the game Wednesday, video Thursday, video Friday for the game Saturday, video Sunday, and then that's it until the end of the World Cup. Yeah. So our two weeks are just, it's, it's either video day or game day. <laughs> just looking here. No, Dimitri Payet is on the bench in answer to that question. Yeah, I, I took a look at that when they were playing the other day, Rob, and I was actually quite disappointed to see the snake actually in the squad, to be honest with you. I'll tell yeah. you what, listen, regardless of what you say, whether he could keep it in his pants or not, um, allegedly, um, he was a great player for us. Yes. Um, it doesn't, listen, forget how, forget how he went about what he did. Remember the playing time with us. He was outstanding. And uh, someone else who was outstanding was the guy that we've had on for the first hour of this. We just interviewed Tony, Tony Cotty. Cotty. And if you've if you've sort of like if you've turned up and you've just seen us two here rambling on, and you're like, well, where the bloody hell was the main event? He was here probably for about the first hour, so you're going to have to go back and watch it from the beginning. But um, no, you're going to have to please go back and watch it. Luckily, if you're up, go back and watch. I'm quite heartened by the fact that he's he said one of his parting shots was that he enjoyed it and he he basically he'd like to do it again. I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> can we are we allowed to call him friend of the channel now, Rob? I think we can. I, I think, think we can, we'll can't we? We'll 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 run that by him Friday. We'll run it by him and, and, and Crossy. I, I think Crossy, I think Crossy, we can definitely say, you know, a three hour marathon where we had to kick him out. I think we can well, say, we yeah, he's a friend Friday of the channel. Well. Sorry? I think we're going to have to speak to Marlon and Trevor about appearances as well. I think that we might need to be exchanging yeah. numbers. Yeah, possibly. Might possibly. Have to be a conversation. But for those of you guys that didn't catch it earlier, there's the event that's taking place. There it is, in case you didn't see it, ladies and gentlemen. I'm nice like that. Um, tickets are £20 per person. I believe there are tickets still available. Call or text 07958 472 847. It is hosted by Mr. Tony Gale. It is on Friday, the 4th of November at the Romford Rusk Club with Marlon Harewood, Tony Cotty, David Cross, Trevor Morley and Brian Deere. E13 events, that's your go-to. I'm not going to ask Brian Deere, though, Rob. Why? Because I think he'll be another one like David Cross. We could be there for three or four weeks. Bring it on. Because he's amazing. Bring it on. Again, when the, the event we went to when he was talking about Colton Cole, he told him to shut up, didn't he? Because he'd scored four goals in 20 minutes. <laughs> it took him less time to score. He scored, more, he scored more goals in 20 minutes than Colton had scored in a season or something. It's, it's what he said to him, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, he, uh, he, he he knew how to find the back of the net. In fact, looking here, he holds the record for the quickest ever five goals in an English game. 20 minutes either side of half time in a home tie against West Brom, 16th of April, 1965. He's a Not lovely bloke. I've, I've met him a couple of times, um, Brian Deere. Oh, bloke. Lee, you're a, you're a gent. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. A nice comment. That's, it's, it's nice, Thank sort of like Lee. when we get. And I've met Lee. Like I've met Lee. Lee yes. walked up one afternoon at my pub and scared the shit out of me. He turns around and tells me he knows who I am and says, Hello, Duke. And I'm standing there going, um, What? He goes, Oh, what's your YouTube channel? It's Lee. I was like, Oh, thank God for that. Oh, I thought it was, you know, some geezer with a, a warrant out for my arrest or that, something. That is the it. slightly unnerving thing when someone comes up to you and, and they're talking to you and you're like, uh, Do I know you? And then that all of a sudden, they. they... Times, Rob, isn't it? Yeah. So, anyway, well, I think we're probably going to knock it on the head now because uh, my, so. my dinner. So, and I'm going to go watch, I don't know, I've got them both on downstairs. I'll go watch one or the other. Ladies and gentlemen, if you wouldn't mind, do us a favour, drop a like on the stream if you haven't done so already. Subscribe to the channel, hit that bell as and when we get any other content that we add because we're going to be putting on 
uh, the preview for FCSB tomorrow. What time are we doing that? Eight o'clock? Eight, yeah, same as same Okay, we're going to do that about eight o'clock. And uh, yeah, so come along. And uh, as I say, hit the like, hit the subscribe, hit the bell. You know it makes sense. And Don't all that bell. jazz. Not your you're... bell. Not oh, your bell. Sorry, okay. Yeah. Duke, what are we? Massive. Absolutely massive. And that's Falls from Iron, not West Ham. Yeah. And uh, before we, we hit the outro credits, I, it's be rather remiss of me not to hit this button. Falls from Iron is proud to support Iron Supporting Food Banks. They are a group of West Ham United fans and friends inspired by the work of other football fan food banks around the country. They collect food and cash donations from Newham Food Bank in Beckton, who supply seven distribution centres in the borough, seven days a week, and hand out several hundred three-day emergency food packs every month to families in need. They are also working with other groups to improve conditions for vulnerable adults and children in the Newham community. They are supported in their efforts by West Ham United Football Club, the WHU Foundation, LS185, London Legacy Development Corporation, Newham Council, the Met Police, Spire London East Hospital, Expedient Security, and a large number of West Ham and football fans. You can help by making a donation to their Just Giving page. You will find the link to this in the description section of the video details in this stream. Thank you for your support. Come on, you irons.